that can all be summed into you know, he's pretty he's pretty old now, so it's kind of uh, well, it's, real, it's a real um, pleasure to be here, and I think that um, you know I, I I do a lot of sort of speaking to you know faculty of medicine, psychiatry, this kind of idea, and 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 one of the things that I really sort of you know sort of matured in the day is sort of understanding how you know a whole group of professionals need to come together to help people with mental mental illness, and and in the military we actually do have the model of that multidisciplinary care, whether it's you know physiotherapy, social work, OT psychology, psychiatry, this kind of idea. And and I think one of the things is is that, that that system is really what people in Canada ought to get. And I think so the current systems don't allow for that. So we can certainly discuss a little bit about, you know, how, how, you know, if a psychiatrist sees somebody and and at this time they have PTSD, but the most important thing might be couples therapy for their family, you know, we're able to do that. And I think and I think so part of that the messaging is is how do we sort of, you know, advocate for a team-based care in, in, in building systems and systems that are sort of very siloed and broken up? So I think that's one of the. So I'm, I'm thrilled to be here, sort of not speaking in front of a bunch of doctors or soon-to-be doctors kind of ideas. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit. You know, one of one of the things you know that I that I think. You know, at some point, I wish to sort of talk myself out of a job and not have to kind of do this because, I, you know, at that point, mental illness will just be another illness. Just we don't sit there and have lectures on sprained ankles and hypertension and cholesterol. So, but you know, I think mental illness is the elephant in the room quite often. And, and the reason I say that is is that we tiptoe around it. We tiptoe around it. You know, somebody that's been a great performer, they're they're not coming to work on time anymore. They're they're always late. They're coming disheveled and their eyes are red, this kind of idea. And, and and what do we do about it as organizations? Never mind health professionals. What we do we do about our coworkers, our family members, this kind of idea. And so so part of the messaging is is how do we sort of address this thing that we've kind of known about known about all along. And I think for us in the military, one of the things that that you know in many ways the 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 blessing of of the, the silver lining of a war is it kind of puts Casualties, whether they're psychiatric or or physical, front and center, it allows us to stop and look at sort of how do we take care of this, how do we look at this, and hopefully in the same way we can um, we can help sort of others in, you know in society sort of advance advance the approaches. You know, one of the interesting things about Canadian military history is is that we've some of us have grown up sort of in that, but you know I thought Canadians were peacekeepers kind of idea, but if we look back historically. You know, we've done quite a lot of stuff over our over our um, history. You know, from the Boer War, World War One, World War Two. You know, heavy, heavy combat, fighting. You know, trenches, all of these kind of very, very historic kind of battles, and we were involved in those. And and just like Australia, there's a real kinship with Australia. I mean, a full 10% of our population. You know, we had seven million people in in the time of World War One. Seven hundred thousand people joined the military. 11 million people, over a million people joined in World War II. So think about the scope, think about the size. Now we've got 35 million people and about 60 million Red Force. And so, so in terms of the visibility where we are now compared to where we were, you know, everybody knew somebody that served World War I, World War II. It's, it's changed quite, quite a lot. Shifted to peacekeeping, sort of the whole concept that I was involved in Israel in that sort of you know, blue berets and watching sometimes in knee-high socks and shorts, no weapons kind of idea. You know, where it is, it's not, you know, we may go back to peacekeeping, but it's never going to be that again, this kind of idea. Humanitarian disaster relief, something that we've always prided ourselves on, the dark going into places like Rwanda and sort of being knee deep in the body parts and things like that, something we've always done. And now we've kind of gone back into sort of war fighting, but a different kind of war fighting, something that we call asymmetric war, which is like small teams that are sort of doing things, not big, large armies sort of marching against each other. So, so back to fighting, but different. So, so the organization has had to sort of morph and sort of create itself over time. And now who knows what's going to happen with this, you know, whether we go to Libya and Syria and Iraq and all this kind of stuff, and, and there'll be sort of different things. So just to keep in mind that things have morphed, but we've always had injuries, we've always had psychological injuries, we've always had physical injuries, and there's always been a toll on families, on communities when, when we send our people to, to do these kinds of things. You know, PTSD itself, you know, we'll talk a little bit about PTSD as, as we go along, but Ben Shepard, who's, who's written a very interesting book sort of on, you know, right from World War One up to sort of, you know, post, 
you know, really post-Vietnam and some of those things, wrote, wrote a book. And one of the passages that I think is really interesting, and this discussion that we have sort of at the NATO level, and you can look at sort of the doctors of the PTSD generation, the part that's involved, you know, the problem is first denied, then exaggerated, then understood, and finally forgotten. In the ferment of war, this cycle is speeded up. In the languid, well-funded peacetime, we talk about the 80s, it has taken two decades for the wheel to turn. So, so what tends to happen historically is World War One. Hey, we got it. We understand this trauma stuff, this shell shock, and you know, you have like Captain Rivers sort of standing in front of the British sort of medical association talking about his famous speeches, and and people said, okay, now we've got it. We're never going to forget it. Kind of forgot it. World War Two it resurfaced. Vietnam it resurfaces. So the idea of it sort of going through this cycle. And, and, you know, my colleagues and people like us say, okay, well, this time we've got it, this time we're not going to forget it, so we're kind of in, are we in that same cycle, are we there? I think right now, I mean, in Canada, we talk about denied, exaggerated, understood. We're probably somewhere between exaggerated and understood. You know, I think there's a, there's a tendency now, you know, a military person or a veteran, you know, jaywalks, he must have PTSD, he does something, he must have, so it reached that point of like, Everything bad that goes on has to be PTSD. So we're kind of in that phase. Hopefully we'll sort of realize that, you know, there's probably a medium of it. Um, and, and, and whether or not as a society we're going to sort of understand, you know, the toxic effects of trauma and the way it can sort of, you know, it cause or whether it's illness or whether it's subthreshold impact people, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that we can sort of keep, you know, keep sort of remembering, remembering this. Just some of the images, sort of from World War One, and just just you know, blows your mind. And, and we we did think it was the last one, and that's something that people genuinely genuinely believed. And it just just blows your mind to think about sort of what people went through. And the, and I always have to recheck the numbers. Now, um, during my introduction, somebody kindly mentioned sort of the the the, the chair that I have, and and it's, it's Dr. Meekins, Brigadier Meekins, who was a Sort of a physician in World War One, sort of a the kind of guy that was a rock star before he, there were rock stars kind of idea. He was the head of the Canadian Medical Association, the head of the American Medical Association, like just a, just a brilliant guy. And and one of the things that they again they kind of got a hundred years ago, then we've forgotten now we remember is that when they were looking at the use of gas in World War One, sort of you know. Um, sarin, you know, not sarin gas, but chlorine gas, and all these different gases, sometimes phosphorus, this kind of idea. Um, you know, so the smart thinkers of that time realized that you're never going to defeat an army by killing people with these gases. You know, you, you might kill a hundred people, you might kill ten, this kind of thing, but you're going to scare everybody. Right? You're going to introduce stress. You're going to introduce. So you're sitting there in these trenches for weeks at a time, and all of a sudden a bang goes off. Gas, gas, gas. You put on your thing. You're you, you're you're wearing this stuff for a little while. You're not sleeping. This kind of idea. Fast forward a hundred years later, you know you've got the enemy using improvised explosive devices. They're not going to defeat the most modern army in history by blowing the up or one convoy at a time, one vehicle at a time, but you're sure going to scare a lot of people. You're sure going to have people not sleeping at night worried about what's going to happen tomorrow. And when you look at sort of the terrorist tactics, whether it's Paris, whether it's places like that, that's the same idea as well. You kill a hundred people, but you actually affect you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. So the idea, again, we knew it a hundred years ago, we're kind of realizing now that, you know, that the psychological component of things is is really um, a big piece of this. You know, the other thing that that we knew years and years ago, we knew that the impacts of trauma last people for a very long time. You know, and, and whether that's through disease, whether it's through life changing moments, these kinds of ideas, and, and we've sort of naively taken sort of an insurance company model of okay. It's been a year or two, you should be over it by now, this kind of idea. But but when you look back at claims that were made, insurance claims, you know, uh, veterans claims from World War I, you know, the highest number of claims came just a year or two before World War II started. So people sort of hang on, hang on, and then things start to erode, their coping kind of erodes. And, you know, just like with physical injuries, eventually things take their toll. So psychological in the same way, you know, think, things impact people for, for a long time. And here, you know, the Dutch, the Dutch people, the, the young sort of celebrate and they're really pleased. And, you know, I have, I have tons and tons of useless information in my head, but the Dutch women are the tallest women in the world, in case people have ever noticed or realized that. They're all very tall and blonde kind of thing. And, um, 
But when you when you look at the faces of, of the people, how serious and how how you know it's it's not always celebrating because at the same time that you're celebrating is the bitter bittersweet aspect of you've lost a colleague, you've lost somebody, and a friend of yours, you know, kids kids other kids have lost their parents. These kind of ideas. So. So it's an impact on generations, and trauma does have that effect. And I think it's really important when we when we take our approaches. I mean, this is where we need to toss away the medical model, disease model of like that illness happens in the one person. We have to look at sort of the impact on the family, the impact on the generation, the workplace, all of these kinds of things. So we need to really look at look at approaches to helping people that that are going to be you know across the board horizontally and vertically within within families and the systems in which they in which they interact. So I'll talk a little bit about Afghanistan, sort of our, our sort of tour, and you know, for people that don't know, sort of, you know, the, the arrows pointed towards Kandahar, sort of quite close to Pakistan. So, you know, the the sort of the Taliban are going back and forth. It's their tribal region, so they don't recognize sort of the borders that that the West has sort of imposed on them years before. But as I show the pictures, I want you to kind of think about sort of the um, the perspective of the soldier going through it, right? So, so you're in this place. You know, you're sort of at a, at a high stress kind of thing most of the time, so a lot of cortisol, a lot of adrenaline kind of flowing through your system. Um, you're physically tired because you're carrying things, you're, you're sort of injured to some extent, you're, you're, you're carrying you know, 50, 60, 70 pounds of equipment on yourself most of the time. Um, there's no way you can drink enough to stay hydrated, there's no way you can sleep enough to be rested, right? So again, Physiologically, it's not just about what the mind is going through, but the body's often in a, in a suboptimal mode as you're sort as you're sort of going through um, th- these types of missions. A very open country, and when you think about sort of the enemy coming in, and and you know in this case the enemy, the Taliban had almost like a, a mystical kind of a, a, a story, and they were like they came out of nowhere because a lot of them were wearing sandals and things. They were quiet. They were everywhere, kind of thing. So so the head on the swivel. So you look here. How, how exposed these guys are on patrol. Like you think, you know, you've got a rock sort of behind some of these folks, but I mean, not everybody's going to fit behind the rock. So, so the idea of being exposed, the idea of being vulnerable, so the idea of having that heightened awareness sort of all the time is something that's that's. I, mean, I show this picture quite often because I kind of th- imagine what these two young soldiers are told. They're probably told, you know, just stand here, watch the vehicle, look out for anything unusual, right? So. So that's a pretty tall task to do there. So, there, so again, imagine how you're feeling, how, how, how nervous you are as your as your colleagues are going to count on you to have the vehicle there in case it's there. A very very harsh, dry, you know, sandstorms that are worse than some of our so, snowstorms kind of kind of environment. So we understand this is from from our Dutch colleagues, so Eric Vermetten, who's a, who's a good friend. Um, just looking at so more and more understanding of sort of what's happening in the body, right? We're understanding more and more of sort of the, you know, the stress hormones that what's happening in the brain, the the areas of the brain that sort of you know evaluate fear, memory, um, the adrenals, the glands. We're looking more and more at sort of the inflammatory markers. So again, you know, it's a common pathway between a lot of the things that you know you'll see as a physiotherapist, the, the fibromyalgia, those kinds of things. You know, the inflammation that, that's in, in MTBI, the inflammation that's in PTSD, all sort of seems to be pointing towards this, this common pathway of this inflammation. And, and, and that's why helping people with diet and with sort of the, the free radical stuff and all this stuff kind of starts to make sense for more and more illnesses. So, so we're really understanding more and more of how it's sort of beyond that. Um, you know, th- this is this is one of our G wagons, sort of our, our super loaded. Um, you know, and, and all four people that were in this vehicle vehicle died. And I, and I sort of this is the, the adjustment that we had to make as a force because you know back in the in the old days, you know, many years ago when I was a you know a medical officer in Borden, it was sort of just post Cold War, a piece had kind of broken out kind of thing, and um, and we never really in our minds imagined sort of going back to this. So we used to have people from Ottawa, I should be careful how I say this because now I'm a person from Ottawa, but we used to have people from Ottawa come to our base, they used to go to a, to a junkyard and get a, get a blown up vehicle, and then they used to exercise us and say, okay, so you come to the scene and you know, you're the pregnant woman that's gone into labor, you're the person that's injured, and just evaluate how we respond to these situations. And, and to think that sort of within a generation we're going to be somewhere where people are actually really doing that and we're facing this is kind of, uh, you know, it was something to get our, mi- get our minds around. 
you know, people going home in many ways. I mean, you know, so when people left, and they left usually towards Landstuhl to our, to our colleagues in the U.S., the German German hospital, they often left with a almost an ICU attached to them. So one of the, the interesting things is is that, you know, two or three surgeries in Kandahar, two or three surgeries in, um, in, in Germany, and then come home. So often... You know, the the last memory is being there and somebody else look out, and then they wake up in a hospital in Canada. Right? They wake up with health professionals like you and me around them, trying to make sense of where they are and, and and what's going on, kind of idea. So the idea that you know when they come home everything's fine, it just sort of just begins. They've got to try to piece back and and the guilt of leaving your colleagues behind, even if you've been hurt, all this kind of stuff. They'll find out if somebody else died, all of these kinds of things, and and it could be. Almost weeks before they're really awake again to, to try to process some of some of these some of these things. You know, another way of going home, sadly, you know, the ramp ceremonies, and and um, I attended sort of you know way too many of those. And and you know, as, as a psychiatrist, you know, you sort of look at the blank stares, you look at the faces, and and the reality of it is, you got the American colleagues, so we used to all sort of go out and, and sort of you know honor the fallen of our, of, our, of the other nations. And, and, you know, oddly enough, you know, you got used to it. You know, you, you think there when your first time you go that you're not going to get used to it, but you do get used to it, you go out, you do it, then you go back to doing your job or go back to sleep or whatever, whatever kind of thing. So, so again, another, another way of leaving. You know, the, the, the thing about, the thing about PTSD and the thing about, you know, I'm not going to go into the diagnostic criteria, but quite often, you know, we'll, we'll sit there and we'll say to people, you know, like what is the trauma? What causes the trauma? And people say, "Well, I was there too. It didn't happen." And oddly enough, you know, being shot at for a soldier isn't actually as much of a big deal as we kind of. I mean, I kind of hate it, but you know, being shot at, it's the other things. It's the little things. It's the, it's the human suffering. It's seeing children that are hurt. This kind of idea. And I often, I often show this picture, and, and you can take a look at sort of, you know, he's got some medical equipment, electronic thermometer, these kind of things. So, so here's a medical person. And, and, you know, three years later, he might be treated with PTSD because that little little boy that died in his arms, right? And everybody else, look at what they're doing. They're just carrying on, right? And sometimes we have the situation where people say, well, I was there too. There was no little boy. I don't know what this guy's talking about kind of idea, right? So, really, so it's really important to sort of remember that trauma is in the eye of the beholder. And, and 10 people can be at the same place, but somebody experiences something different. So I think it's a really important, you know, we deal with that with insurance companies, with veterans affairs organizations, this kind of idea. So we need to sort of realize that, you know, we might have that big trauma of things blowing up, but somebody's trauma may be different than what we, what we think. So it's very difficult for us to sort of impose that. You know, other things, we're talking about, you know, confronting child soldiers, those kinds of things. Again, different things. You know, other than the, the stereotype of just, you know, we were blown up kind of idea. You know, exposure again to sort of, you know, the locals, the local casualties, the suffering again with Canadian sentimentalities, you know, caring about children. You know, we, we have, you know, you're away from your own children, so there's a temptation to get engaged with, with the local children, this kind of idea. And, and there's always a bittersweet aspect to this because, you know, the kids get hurt and, and you know, they... They call it collateral damage. So if we did it, then we'll have to look after them. But we often end up leaving them and transferring them to a healthcare system that's not up to our standard. And there's always sort of the ethical issues of, of some of these things. So these are the things that are going on to the to the psychological aspects of sort of the health professionals that are there as well. And so we understand now more and more sort of the combat brain. We understand sort of what happens when people are repeatedly exposed to trauma repeatedly and, and you know what aspects of the brain get, get affected so we're, we're hopeful that we're going to start to understand you know more and more in terms in terms of how we do things you know but I think you know the other the other important thing that you know when we when we talk about sort of you know military medicine and its role and, and you know in World War one you know plastic surgery was sort of invented in the military when when uh, you know Harold Gillis Walter Yo burned his face and the, the first flap surgery you know, antibiotics in World War II, the golden hour of trauma. So, so military, you know, one of, one of the winners of war, and the few winners of war actually is medicine and advancing things. So, so for us, you know, we talk about all this the PTSD stuff and, and exposing people to these horrible things, but really what we're talking about is we're talking about workplace mental health. We have a workplace, 
you know, you have a workplace, you have jobs, your students, whatever, and it's, and it's how you treat people that have mental illness and how you as an organization respond. So ours is a workplace like everyone else, and, and a great deal of what sort of what we've learned and what other people have learned, you know, over the last decade or so can certainly be generalizable. And the main thing in 2016, maybe, maybe not 15 years ago, it's actually not a doom and gloom in the sense that there's lots of things that can be done, and, and it can be done at a, at a professional level, it can be done at a personal level, it can be done at, at an institutional level. And, you know, the other part about sort of, you know, it ain't all PTSD is while PTSD garners all the attention, you know, within the military, within society, by far depression is the greatest burden. And even after trauma, after motor vehicle accident, after rape, after these kinds of things, you know, depression is more common than PTSD even after this. So, so it's really important not to get excited by the shiny thing that's PTSD and just remember that you know, good old sort of boring depression is still going to be the number one sort of burden of, of mental illness and, and really the, the biggest burden of health in, in our Western society. So, you know, so what can we do? I, I think that's part of, you know, why I'm here and this kind of thing. And I, I think demystify mental illness. I mean, I'd love to talk myself out of a job. I'd love for us just to look at, you know, mental illness as just another illness. I mean, we, we don't run around, you know, worried about, you know, you don't have, in the military, we have a directorate of mental health. Within our Surgeon General's headquarters, we have a director of mental health. We don't have a directorate of hypertension. We don't have a directorate of, you know, high cholesterol. We don't have a directorate of MSK. So part of, you know, part of what I'd like, you know, mental health to be is just another health issue. No more, no less kind of idea. And, and you know, the, the, fact that it's, the fact that it's real. And I, and I think, you know, there's, there's lots of, you know, Ontario study mental illness impacts said to be bigger than all the cancers combined. That was the Ontario study. You know, $51 billion problem to our GDP. You know, there's a lot of sort of attention, PTSD, you know, we don't do enough, which is which is fine from the ombudsman. You know, but I think but I think it starts with just sort of accepting it as part of life experience. I mean, so the idea isn't, you know, you know, you you've sent people away, you've caused PTSD, you've got to stop this PTSD. It's more of a recognition that part of the life experience, part of exposing people to things is going to be people are going to come back hurt, and part of those hurt part of that hurt is going to, is going to be the injury. You know, we can address the issue, and, and we've addressed it, and there's other organizations, you know, and I'll talk a little bit about some of these things, and then we'll be able to, you know, have a little bit of a discussion, but, you know, there's a cultural change that needs to occur, you know, there's organizational elements, there's leadership factors, there's individual training, and I'll talk a little bit about some of the things that we've done that I think can be generalizable, and I'm confident can be generalizable to sort of, you know, everyday, everyday society. And the important thing to realize, you know, that, you know, when we look at sort of health and determinants of health is, is regardless of how much I value myself, you know, the, you know, the health treatment is a very, very small part of health. The determinants of health in terms of whether it's physical health or psychological health, you know, the employment, working conditions, education, literacy, physical environment, social supports, you know, child development, biological, culture, all of these different things. And the health services. So, so the, the important thing to do is to, to think about, you know, being mentally healthy isn't just having the absence of disease, right? So, so part of as a society, as a culture, we need to have people to engage in meaningful work, meaningful relationships, those kinds of ideas. If they hurt themselves, we're there. But really, the point is to sort of, uh, you know, sort of advance people in that way. So the cultural change. I mean, we're a hierarchical organization, and and really. It starts with the guy at the top. In the military, we sort of have a saying that, you know, your boss's problem becomes your problem, right? So that's kind of a, probably works in academia as well. So, so if the general is concerned and says, hey, mental health is everybody's responsibility and it really means it, there's a trickle down. So it's a trickle down and it's, and it's up. And, and George Cope did the same thing with Bell, like a, like a genuine commitment kind of idea. Again, your boss's problem becomes your problem kind of thing. So, so creating a culture that encourages help seeking and ensuring that help is there. That, there. There's a funding piece, there's a values piece, there's this kind of idea, but setting that tone that tone from the stop to, to change the culture, you know, which we had to do. Organizational standards. So within the organization themselves, you know, the Mental Health Commission has, has created the Psychological Safe Standard. You know, organizations like Bell have adopted it. There's 13 elements in it. I think we'll talk about it in a little while. And, you know, and, and what that really boils down to is, is that 
you know, just like when you when you do something, you consider the safety of things. You consider, you know, it's probably a sign somewhere how many people can be in this room at one time and all this. Before. You know, you can't walk through an airport or a mall in Canada without sort of a yellow sign, the floor is wet, this kind of idea. And I, and I think the main thing is to think about the psychological impact of every decision you make. Think about sending 200 people to a war zone. Think about, not, not don't send them, but think about what it means, what we need to have in place before, after this kind of idea. If you're making a decision and you're sort of expecting people to, to work, and one of the examples that I give is that if, you know, if I've got a deadline to get something done, to get something done, and I decide to play golf one afternoon, that doesn't mean I move the deadline ahead for my staff and get people working. It might mean I have to come in on the weekend to do it myself instead of imposing it. So you have to think about the workload, think about what we're doing to our people, enhance the treatment that's available, screening if necessary, which again is something that we that we believe in, you know, and ultimately have timely access to evidence-based care. It's, it's, the, it's, the mental, it's the ability to care for people. Right now, if we reduce stigma, if everybody that wants to see a mental health professional raise their hand wanted to, the system would break, right? So, so we have to sort of create that capacity. We have to be creative how we, how we do that. A couple of concrete things that we've done that I, that I think are helpful is, you know, we created a term operational stress injury in an attempt to kind of legitimize these illnesses and so people understand that, you know, they've, they've been hurt. In a concrete way, what we've done is, is that if, if, you know, three soldiers are in, a, in, a, in an armored personnel carrier that gets blown up, you know, one person dies, one person has, gets amputated, and one person has PTSD, all three will be recognized by sort of a sacrifice medal for their sacrifice. So we've, we've tried to sort of, as much as possible, even our approaches to physical injuries and psychological injuries, those, those kinds of ideas. You know, we, we, again, looking at specific things, you know, Kandahar, we, we, we deployed a mental health team. We sent a team in because we were looking at the exposures that people were having. So we had a full time, you know, we had psychiatry in place, social work, mental health, nursing. The Americans would contribute to the team. Now, the leadership piece, I think, is really important. And Bell has addressed that with training for all their, their managers, this kind of idea. Because I think that's the hardest job. It's very easy for a politician or for a general you know, CEO of a company to say, this is really important. But I think it's the managers and the middle managers that really, that really struggle. Because it's a difficult job. You've got, you've got a job to get done. You've got tasks. And it's extremely inconvenient that two of your six people have a mental illness or can't work today or can't do, you know. So, so we have to kind of understand that it's, it's, not, it's not okay to, to sort of blame the middle manager, but it's to give them the confidence, the confidence and the cover to be able to help, to help their people. And, you know, does somebody need a pat on the back? Do they need a kick in the ass? This kind of idea. So we need to train the leaders to understand mental illness, not become therapists, but to be able to have that difficult discussion. We talked about the elephant in the room in the first slide, but if you've got somebody that's that's clearly off course, that's showing up late, that's this, do we have the skills to kind of ask them into your office, em empathically engage them? Is everything okay? You know, I, is there any help that you can... So, so we need to give people the tools to kind of deal with these things and, and have them... You know, the, the last point is that if somebody's having huge stressors, family discussions, you know, financial problems, I mean, it may make more sense to give them the afternoon off than to sort of, you know, discipline them or, or give them sort of difficulties. So, so giving our so our senior leaders need to give the middle managers the the, the license to sort of manage their people and, and, and address these things. You know, individual training and education. So again, we've done this. The Mental Health Commission is starting with RCMP, but this some of this stuff is, I think that we should be teaching in high schools, certain universities, kind of idea. And so, so we know a lot from sports psychology and, and elite soldiers in terms of um, of giving people the tools to deal with stressful situations. You know, our um, and we have, you know, we, we've developed sort of a, a road to mental readiness, which is what we call it, our R two M R. And it's, and it's a way to sort of decrease stigma, give people the tools, the skills they need to deal with stressful situations. What we found is after we give people this training, it gives them the confidence to deal with stressful situations, but also reach out for help if they need it. So it really has that two-pronged pronged advantage. And we've institutionalized it. It starts at the recruit level, so right when, you know, 17, 18-year-old kids, because if you're a young kid from a small town, you know, joining the military and, and 
experiencing that culture and having people that yell at you all the time just because they want to yell at you all the time and even if you think you're doing the right thing they yell at you some more and that cultural kind of thing so that's the most stressful thing so it's not about combat about dying about risking your life at this point this is the most stressful thing and I think for some people university is the most stressful thing they faced up until now so so what we've done is we, we put we give them this training sort of this and I'll talk a little bit about what it is um, right from the recruit level and every time you advance where you start to become responsible for other people you get a refresher of how to look after yourself but also to be able to look after, look after the people you're charged with and then when you're going to deploy we overemphasize it when you deploy on your way back we, we have a family version of it so the family will have to watch for this this kind of idea and the, uh, the, a big part of it what we've done is we've, we've gone away from the, the sort of the the dichotomy of healthy or ill. I mean, just like, you know, physical health, you know, psychological health is the same thing. It's not like you're you're perfect and all of a sudden you're broken, right? So the idea that, you know, you can be healthy, you can be reacting, you can be injured, you can be ill, the arrows go sort of, sort of back and forth. And so, you know, at around exam time, a lot of students could probably be in the reacting phase. There's, there's this kind of idea. So... But, but you can drift back and forth between them. And, and I, think, I think that's important because giving people a list of this is the symptoms of depression, does this fit you or not, isn't that helpful. So the idea of having people think about the continuum really helps. Explain to people the stress and good stress, bad stress, this kind of idea, which is part of the continuum because, you know, like sports psychology teaches you, you know, if you're, if you're about to run a race, you kind of want to have some knots in your stomach, you want to be a little bit sweating because otherwise people are going to take off ahead of you. You know, but if you're behind the bleachers puking while everybody else is getting ready, that might be a little too much stress, right? But no stress isn't good. And I think I think part of that basic education, I think, is, is part of is part of what we do. We train people, we teach them these skills. You know, the big four. And what what we'll do is, and so it's not just education; it's training. But what will happen is, is if you if you ask people to think about, you know watching the Olympics or, you know, a, a gymnast or somebody like this and they're, and they're about to do their dive or their, their, their tumble, what are they doing? They're standing there, you know, they're goal setting, they're, they're, they're doing this, they're visualizing themselves doing the tumble like they've done thousands of times before, they're using self-talk, I can do this, I've done this before, I can do this. We use the cool term tactical breathing just because it's a military kind of thing, but really control your breathing. That's what you see every athlete do that. You see a person on the free throw line in basketball, this kind of idea. So, so these are true, simple things that people learn and practice, whether it's before an exam, before sleep, you know, a board meeting, this kind of thing. It's not really about combat. It's about sort of getting, getting prepared. And, and we've really found that people, people take, take, have taken on to this thing and it helps them. We teach people to sort of monitor their health, not and each other's health, not in the sense of diagnostic criteria for an illness, because that's so binary. But really, you know, you ask people to look at their mood. You know, is it normal? Are they irritable? Angry? So, so we basically tell everybody when they're coming back from a mission, you know, like Afghanistan, you're probably all kind of in the yellow right now. You know, you're you're you're, you're a bit sarcastic. You might be a bit forgetful. You might have some trouble sleeping. This kind of idea. You've just been through this, so let's watch it. It should sort of normalize. Stay in the yellow for a while. Come back into the green. Maybe if it goes in towards the orange, get help. This kind of idea. Just helping people to sort of self monitor, looking at. So, but but again, so much more than symptoms. We're looking at how they're how they're physically active, how they're physically and how they're doing and interacting with other people. Because again, it's much more than just a, a symptom checklist of illness. Normalizing reactions. You know, it's okay not to be distressed. It's okay to be distressed. I think I think it really is important. Somebody shouldn't think something's wrong with them if they're not freaking out or if they are freaking out. So the idea, the eye of the beholder, and sort of help people to understand that people can have the exact same exposure to something and have completely opposite reactions, and that's okay. So I think that's, again, really important messaging early on. We give people the individual responsibility, and again, it's in writing, it's written, we've got apps, we've got all this kind of stuff just to remind people, you know, the healthy lifestyle, focus on the task at hand, how you help people to focus and cope. Again, how you can see is this has really nothing to do with combat and war. This has to do with life skills. It has to do with everyday life, which is which is what we want to teach our kids. Improve social support. You know, we, we don't want we don't want our colleagues to become therapists. 
We want them to be good friends. We want them to listen, ask questions, don't judge, delay offering advice. So we're, we're training people and we role play during this training. You role play what would you do with somebody that was thinking this, this kind of idea. And, and the funny thing about, you talk about the stereotype of the military. When we first rolled it out, one of our social workers, you know, about this big, went over to Gagetown, big army base, these big, big infantry guys. And, I, and she came back, I said, how did it go? She goes, it was okay. You know, the, the biggest complaint we had from these soldiers was there wasn't enough time to role play. You know, so, so, so don't assume that people don't get into this and this kind of idea. So, so role playing, learning how to do this was, was really, really important to them and remains, remains a part of it. You know, again, with our leaders, we talk about the shared responsibility of the leaders. It's not just a health response, this kind of idea to give, to give the leaders the idea that they're involved as well. Likewise, the leadership have responsibilities, lead by example, get to know your people, foster the healthy climate, all of these kinds of things. And, and you know, the whole idea of sort of what, what leaders you know, shield, sense, and support what they, what they need to do in the continuum. So, so we, we give this throughout the career. So again, in 2016, it's not like we have to be just sort of passive witness to the, the impact of mental health. There's nothing we can do. There are things that we can do. You know, the, the language is given explicit mission to have to have dialogue after a diff, difficult situation. It's not trivial as stress debriefing, but but you want to have like the sergeant sit down and say to the young soldier, "Yeah, that was your first time in combat. The first time I went through, this is I felt the same way." I mean, so so validate, give them things, and the the assumption of health is a reasonable assumption to make. But then you're monitoring people, then you know your people, you know who doesn't who doesn't sort of which does doesn't bounce back, and and. You know, one example that I share is sort of in theater, you know, we, I had a sort of a senior senior NCO, like a warrant officer, brought in his six people and says, hey, doc, you know, we tried all that stuff, that talking, that breathing stuff, and I'm still concerned a couple of my guys are still in the orange. Do you mind, you know, do, do your team mind taking a look at our guys? And I said, of course, you know, you're first. And, and so we so we were able to sort of, you know, create this where if, if the mental health professionals, the health professionals, the soldiers are all sort of using that same song sheet, the continuum, it's a way of kind of helping people to sort of understand things and, and, and it really has sort of moved, moved forward. Um, can I talk a little bit now? I won't talk about this because I want to... Yeah, and, and, and so this, I, so I think this is sort of the, 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 the genesis of sort of the continuum where, where the idea... And this is where the medical model kind of fails by having cutoffs and this kind of idea. And I think, and I think, you know, as a psychiatrist, or as you learn more and more, and more of the learning has been from the, you know, from the other professionals. More of the learning has been from you know, from physio, from social work, from OT, from this, because you, you don't have to have a disease to suffer. And having a disease doesn't mean you're suffering. I mean, so, so the idea really is that people could be having difficulties dealing with things without meeting a bona fide illness. And, and it's not helpful to say they're not depressed, go away kind of idea. So we need to have a way of sort of understanding and having um, giving people permission to talk about distress at a subclinical level and sort of have, have approaches. And I think that's one of the important things that we've, that we've tried to sort of, um, you know, to have people understand this in, in, the, in the continuum model. Like I said, this is what we tell people when they're when they're coming back from deployment and they're in Cyprus and they're getting their, their education when they come back from the battle zone that that it is normal to sort of feel this way and feeling this way doesn't mean you have a disease. But if you're stuck and it's bothering you, there are things that we can do about it. So I think the idea really is to sort of get people to understand that you know that this is this is literally what we what we tell them. Um, I won't go into this too much because we're you know, we're in, into military stuff. But I think you know the question of what can we do in 2016? Are we doing things? And I think you know what we have is we have some evidence that things are working. We have some evidence that you know cultural change, education, training, dialogue, these kind of things work. And a few things are. You know, I, I mentioned the road to mental illness research. We continue to do research. We continue to do research at the basic training level, and we're looking at we're getting some evidence that pass rates are increasing for people that have the training versus not in their exams and things like this. Um, some of this comes from the special forces, the American sort of SEALs teams, where where their final exam, you know, is kind of like the, when people gone through these weeks and weeks of incredibly rigorous training, but at the end they kind of chain you up and tie you up with these locks and throw you into a pool and you're supposed to get yourself out and survive. So many people used to fail that, very, very good candidates, because they they would sort of lose their, their ability to sort of focus 
and by by introducing sort of two weeks of sort of mental health training, mindfulness, and this kind of stuff ahead of that training, they increase their pass rate by about twenty percent. So so this stuff does work in terms of helping people to achieve achieve their goals. So we so we've found that it's giving people confidence. It, and there's some evidence now that we're probably increasing the pass rate in some of their their courses and things. But it also increases the help seeking because people sort of understand that it's part of the normal and, uh, and I, I work on things just like I sprained my ankle, I tried resting it, I tried putting ice on it, but it still kind of bothers me, so I'm going to go see the doctor, I'm going to go see the physio. Um, we have data now from our 2013 survey that you know, a Canadian Forces member that has a mental illness is much more likely to seek help than a, than a Canadian society, done by Stats Canada, the same survey. So, so something's right, something's working. It may be an artifact of how much help is available, but the help includes going to a family member, going to a coworker, going to your boss, going to a health professional. This kind of idea, and and you know, people are getting care much sooner than they were. It was about seven, seven and a half years of suffering before they went for care, and now people, most people, are within care within months of, of coming back from their deployment. So. So some of that cultural shift, the dialogue sort of, ha- and, and, and the credit really is to the organization. It's not the health, like I said, the health services. We've just been always ready to sort of, sort of receive people. You know, the, the, the biggest challenge though, you know, even after removing all the barriers to care, you know, the treatment itself isn't good enough, you know, for, for mental health conditions. And that's part of one of my, my big themes. So, so, you know, our suicides, civilian or military, you know, of completed suicides, about 50% of the people are in care, 50% of people aren't in care. So so when we look at our good friends in the Mental Health Commission and Bell and all this, you know, we talk about stigma and use of stigma, like getting people into care is just the beginning, it's not the end. Getting people into care doesn't guarantee that that care is going to work and people aren't going to hurt themselves. So we still have the situation just like in civilian society where Somebody sees their psychiatrist on Monday, things are going well. They see their therapist on Wednesday. Then on the Friday, they have a fight with their spouse, have a few drinks, and they're found dead the next day. So, so we still need to continue to work on, on on how do we improve the care, how do we get how do we get hope to the hopeless at that time, this kind of idea. So, there's still there's still a fair amount of work that needs to be done. I think that's the you know I'll, I'll end there because I want to take some time for, for questions and discussions. Thank you. studies for the reservists. I mean, in, in some of our studies, they actually tend to do better. They tend to do better than the workforce. So so there is maybe something healthy about going back to your hometown, going back to your social supports, going back to your job as an accountant, more than going back to this sort of artificially created hometown, which is your base, which is 3,000 kilometers away from your home. So so it is an absolute interest. And, and, and the reservists, of course, always fall into that gray area. Because you know they're, they like I don't have a, a health card, digital health card. I have no choice but to receive my health care from within the system. Reservists have both systems, so so it gets it is it is complicated. And um, you know, in terms of entitlements to care, you know, anything service related, they have it, but that doesn't help you if you're you know 800 kilometers from the nearest base. So so you know, point taken. But the data actually shows that the reservists. Um, don't do any worse, and they might actually do better after deployment. So, so it's it's a, it's an area of absolute attention, but it, but it's not really a crisis in terms of um, you know pro, uh, in terms of you know left left dangling kind of idea. But a good question. Though. Yeah. My question on credibility, and you flash a slide on Cyprus. And sorry, Colin got back, and we we kept putting the room in Cyprus. Uh, I was Nobody really talked. There's a psychiatrist there, but we just sat there with each other. We just want to get to uh, get to the bar and stop drinking. Just for not drinking six minutes. Yeah. Um, 
And there's also one saying with veterans is that we don't talk to outsiders, we just talk about ourselves. Yeah. Um, using, do you have any particularly important folks that who's got clinical uh, psychiatrists or caregivers? Um, do you have any recommendations on do's and don'ts when you talk to uh, talk to veterans? That's a very, very broad question, so I, I don't... I, well, I mean, there, there's, there, you're almost perpetuating a certain stereotype, which might be your own belief, but people do talk. People do talk amongst themselves. There are many, many civilians that have very rich practices with veterans and speak to them and have success with them, and there's some people prefer a male therapist, some people prefer a female, some people want somebody in uniform, some people don't. So. So I think, I think one of the things is, you know, to, to your point, is don't assume. Don't assume anything about a veteran kind of idea and actually be curious in hearing their story. Don't start with pre-assumptions. Don't start with, you know, I understand that you've been to war and that was a terrible thing. What was it like to be in war? Right? So, so, so again, you need to be uh, curious. You need, to, you need to show genuine interest in people. Don't feel sorry for people because it's a volunteer military, people go by their choice, this is what they want to do. But be genuinely curious as to, as to what the experience is for them. Don't assume what was traumatic. Don't assume that you know, being shot at or shooting at people is traumatic, because it may be something else that was traumatic. So I think the key is, is genuine empathy, genuine curiosity, and don't make assumptions. I think that's how, how I would advise for a clinician that's engaging with a, with a veteran. Mm-hmm. And is this something that you're kind of um, looking at Yeah, we're doing, they were trying to do a couple of research projects on, on service dogs. It's a very, um, I won't say controversial, but it's a contentious issue and, and it hits the media every once in a while. And, and so, I mean, service dogs are, you know, the therapy dogs, the service dogs, there's clear definitions, they're protected by charter, every province is different, every state in the U.S. is different. and. And, you know, they fall into the category of disability dogs in the sense that they're supposed to actually help you to overcome a disability. So the blind is a very clear kind of thing. And so, so a serving, it's incompatible with, milita- with a military career to have a dog because we can't exactly take a dog on a ship or on an airplane or in, into a war zone. So for us is that if somebody has tried, you know, all the treat- traditional treatments, they haven't worked, and they want to get a dog as they transition out into the back into the civilian life, you know, they they can certainly have the dog and, and this kind of. But they need to sort of understand that it is incompatible with sort of continuing with, with the service. Um, we're working with um, Canadian Standards Association because it's been a bit of a free for all in terms of what the training of the dogs are. So in terms of defining what the dog is, what the training of the dog is, because. You know, it's, it's incredible when you see the blind dogs, right? You could be in a restaurant for three hours and then the per- person next to you leaves and the, and the dog kind of goes with them kind of idea. So there's a whole bunch of different levels of training from, you know, dogs that sort of aren't as well behaved or aren't as disciplined, this kind of idea. And the industry itself is actually engaged and is interested in doing that. So so I think it'll come. I think I think it will, will come and um, I think it helps some people. You know, I've spoken to people that have said that I got too sick to take care of the dog because I think people, sometimes you have to realize that, okay, the dog takes care of you, but it's also a fair amount of work to look after the dog, right? And so so I think it's 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 going to find its way, but I think the idea of, of service animals is probably here to stay. Yes. Uh, yeah, just actually on the uh, subject of continuing military career, um, I was curious on your thoughts on the uh, TCAT, DCAT system as well as the sort of way that the DAG process is done for your appointment. Okay, so these are um, terms that nobody in the room understands. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I, I can show, show. Yeah, I don't really know how to simplify yeah, yeah, it. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so um, in, in, sorry, I just wanted to uh, yeah. refine my questions a bit yeah. more. Uh, I knew a guy, and uh, he worked in a one tour of Afghanistan. He was in the unit, competent, well liked. Um, and then, you know, the unit was gearing up to go on a second deployment. Um, and everything was good for him until he apparently, he saw a psychiatrist in order to get dyed green, and he ended up getting dyed red because he was having nightmares. So he ended up getting pulled out of the tour, getting sent to the uh, supplementary company. Um, it wasn't seen as a good thing. He didn't like it, apparently, and that's what he told everybody. Um, and everybody felt pretty bad about it. So 
in a way, I think there is still the stigma where people feel like they're being asked to choose between their mental well-being and their job. Yeah. And then that's creating a, a barrier. I'm not just yeah. to see that these yeah. No, no, it's, it's, a, it's a barrier to care, for sure, you know, whether it's stigma or not. I mean, I think, I think part of what we have to also realize is that these are serious health conditions, right? So if you replaced PTSD with degenerative disc disease, right, and said, you know, your back is pretty bad. I'm not really sure you're going to be able to carry 50 pounds and hump. And so... Not this tour, let's do the best possible, but there's still no guarantee your career is going to survive, right? I mean, so it's your choice whether you go forward to get your back fixed, right? So I think, I think that's the key. I think the key ends up being, so there's no way in the world that we're going to guarantee somebody with an illness of any kind, insulin-dependent diabetes. We can't guarantee that the insulin is going to be refrigerated and safe for you. So, you, don't, you know, your career could end if you have insulin-dependent diabetes. Anaphylactics, allergies to a bee sting. We can't guarantee we're going to get you to ventilate. So, so that's that's the reality of health, right? So, the reality of health. So, so that's that's a barrier to care for sure. But it's not stigma. You know, you, you and you make the choice. Like, so if I'm if I'm going to be promoted, you know, from lieutenant colonel to colonel, and my back is really really bothering me, I may not go forward. I may suck it up until I get promoted and then do it. And, I, and I'm taking that risk in my own hands. So. So I think what has to happen is is that, and, and there's no exact science, and we're trying to work on the biomarkers and the objective markers, this kind of idea. But ultimately, you know, the, the, the triad is between the person, you know, the health professional and the organization. And so it would be irresponsible for a clinician to say somebody's okay if going is a risk to themselves or a risk to the mission. The person may disagree, I mean, which is, of course, their opinion kind of idea, and the clinician could be wrong, because there's no exact science kind of idea. But that's the system, and that's the si- there's no approach to mental health that's different than any other health condition. The same thing happens if somebody strains their medial meniscus. The same thing happens if somebody blows a cervical disc, this kind of idea. So that's the system that's going to be there, and, and that's part of, absolutely, that's part of the barrier to care. I get it. I get if somebody's... But, but what we what we want is we want people to understand that you know the treatment of their mental illness of, of their mental illness gives them their best shot at carrying on in their career because if they don't treat it it's going to unravel one way or the other you can't focus you can't concentrate and and if you can't and you do have to transition out of the civilian world it's best to be healthy if you want to do that right so so I'm not gonna you know so I won't in any way sort of pretend that that's not a real barrier it absolutely is. And the disagreements between doctors as well, as to, because we don't have the blood test, we don't have this. But the same thing in disc disease, somebody, two people could have the exact same MRI, one person could be running marathons, one person could be in a wheelchair. Right? So, so there is an, inex, there's an inexact science in it, but it's ultimately in the safety of the person and the safety of the organization. Because I've been in Afghanistan, where five or six people that had PTSD and thought they were better came and melted down in theater and had to, had to be evacuated back as well. So there's two sides to it. There's two sides to it. And who's to know the nightmares weren't going to get worse? And, and you know, what was the person's job? What was the risk to that person and individual? So, so great question. No clear answer on it, but, but, it's, uh, but it's real. But I think it's real um, everywhere. If, 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 uh, if somebody, if, if an RCMP officer admits to a drinking problem and goes gets care, it might affect their security classification later on. So it's, it's part of it's, it's part of illness. It's part of part of wellness. It's part of disability management. It's part of all of these things. Colonel Jetley, your acumen for the health services in the military as well as your feel for the real issues has really helped sensitize us to the, to the to the mental health, but also the, the broader health issues, not just mental, but physical issues that um, that our military experience. Your point about the mil- you know, the military um, advances in the military at some point trickle down to the broader society is an excellent point. And it seems that we have some of the data that our society actually does as, as a whole does to have. So I'd like to thank you very, very much for your wonderful um, talk as well as the question and answer. Thanks very much.